It's time for the Wrestling Observer Extra. With Dave Meltzer, right here on The Law, live audio wrestling. And let's go, my now smoking with the best, the best. Hour two of The Law, live audio wrestling begins. I am John Pollock, along with Dan the Mouth Lebransky. And it is time to welcome in the editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which you can get all the information at WrestlingObserver.com for. He is Dave Meltzer, and Dave... After three incredible main events at Woo! Sumo Hall, what are your conclusions coming out of the G1 <laughs> Climax? Oh, man, that was, that, that, those were a lot of fun. That was amazing, eh, Dave? What's such, I, I just, it blows my mind how these guys do this every year like this. They just go all out for this whole tournament. I know, and then they then they pay for it. Not yeah. everyone, but a lot of them pay for it until like January, and then January they all you know they all pretty the, much the, got to kill themselves. Tokyo Dome, Tokyo yeah, Dome. yeah, right, right. But but you see, like a lot of the guys having to tone down, um, you know, for a couple of months after this thing. Yeah. So it's like, but yeah, you watch like Tanahashi, you know, who's just hurting so bad, and then when it comes to those big matches, it's like he's he does it. Yeah, he does it. Does it. I mean, what what did you think of? Uh, I mean, I'm very happy here in Canada because the, we're not doing well in the Olympics. But <laughs> can, Canadian, the first Gaijin ever to win the G1. Dave, this is huge in my mind. I, I I honestly never thought this would happen. Well, I always thought it could happen someday, but I didn't like expect it this year. And yeah, and it's it's notable like it's Kenny Omega because of where he was a year ago he wasn't even in the tournament right right and now I mean there's circumstances I mean I think it was a great choice me too especially, especially after it happened when it was over mm-hmm. then I really thought it was a great choice yeah, I mean, yeah you'd asked me a month ago I would have said it was a good choice but the way he performed those last two nights I mean you know you he was the he's the best wrestler in the world with those performances I mean it's, it's you know he and he always had the talent it was just a question of Harnessing the talent. I mean, him and AJ Styles to me are the most talented guys, and and um, you know AJ just um, I mean more serious in big matches, and but Omega when he wants to do it, I mean he, he was incredible. Yeah, I, I just thought it was a great job. I mean, they kind of put him in that position right after AJ and Nakamura and those guys all left, and I think this really really shows you how much they've gotten behind him to be one like you know the top heel now. Yeah, well, I mean, um, to, to go this far. Yeah. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i wondering how far they go. I mean, is, is it Okada and him at the Tokyo Dome? Which, I mean, the one thing about that is that's a guaranteed incredible match. Yep. I just don't know if they go with that at the Tokyo Dome, but, you know, I mean, they, they, they certainly could. By tradition, they would. So much, Dave. Uh, the post-match promo, I mean, he even said in Japanese, I'm never going to go there. But how much has New Japan, was January this past year a learning curve for them and putting all this stock in Kenny Omega, who it's all well and good to say that, there's going to be a ton of interest for this guy when his contract comes due. Without question. Um, yeah, especially the way wrestling has changed. You know, like if it was five years ago, you know, there would be that mentality, well, because you get over in Japan doesn't mean anything. But when, you know, after like Nakamura and AJ Styles came over and, and even Gallows and Anderson, and, and they had no trouble getting over, I mean, that mentality's gone. And, and a guy who can work like that and talk like that, mm-hmm. I mean, there's not a chance he's not getting over if they don't, if, unless they sabotage him. And with more main top spots on the main roster than you had a year ago with, with two touring brands now and two shows to fill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was always going to be room for him, but there's even more room for him now, and there's more upward mobility for him now. Um, I, you know, and, and you can say what you want to say. I mean, the thing is, is like, I'm sure he's going to make really good money there, but he can, you know, like like some guys. Um, there are some guys who are better off not going to WWE and and taking the independent and New Japan route if they can have it. But financially, I don't think he's one of those guys in the sense I think he could make more money in WWE. But would he be happier? I mean, who knows? I mean, yeah. some, people, some people really like that. And, and there's, you know, there's a certain fulfillment in, in that. Um, you know, everyone's, everyone's different in, in, in what their ultimate goal is. Um, and, and, you know, again, he can always, he can always go there. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know, like what his mentality is going to be, but it's going to, it's got to be a lure if he sees like how much AJ Styles is doing yeah. and how how well he is, because 
if I'm Kenny Omega and I'm looking at AJ Styles, it's like it's like I'm more colorful than him and I can do everything he can do. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like if he's making a million dollars a year, and I don't know that he is, but if he is, it's kind of like that's a pretty big lure. That's incentive, yeah, for sure. Just another quick question about the tournament itself. Uh, were you surprised at Naito or someone like that? I, like Goto in the in the final, I was very surprised by that. I was surprised by both of them. Um, I thought I thought like I didn't know who was going to win A, but I thought that Naito was winning B for sure. Right. I mean that's how I my you know I mean I didn't I didn't there were a couple of guys I thought who could win A, um, and I thought Naito was winning the G one, you know so um, and it's interesting because you know you would think that that he's you know I don't know like when when I look at the Tokyo Dome I still think it's like Okada Naito or Tanahashi two of those three, but now you got Omega in there mm-hmm. and and the other thing too is is Shabbat is ready to go you know I mean that's the other one it's like yeah. my God he's. He's ready to be in that top mix. And, and Ishii, you know, to a degree even now. I mean, I think that, like, this tournament, to, to me, what was so good about it, it was like the old, like the old G1s. It's yes. not so much that it's a great tournament. It's that you made new stars. Yep. Even Yoshihashi and um, um, who was the other one? Say, say Sonata. Yep. Those guys, like, those guys, like, they were clearly elevated in this tournament to a higher degree than they were. And Shibata and, and Ishii are just, like, right up there. And Kenny Omega and Goto, I think both... I think Goto was elevated a little bit, um, but he's still kind of like he still got the same jinx on him that he can't win the big one. Right. But, but Kenny, Kenny is without a doubt a superstar. And Elgin, I think, I think Elgin got stronger too. Yeah, I, I, I think it really did benefit a lot of guys. It, it was outstanding, and I, I, I'm not gonna. Oh, I'm, well, I'm gonna ask you, but if you had to pick one match, because I know this is hard, what would you pick as the best match? Oh, God, and Ishii number one, and Omega and um, Naito number two. Okay. Uh, but my God, there's like six of them. That you're oh, Oka- really I loved Okada over. and Ishii. I thought was unbelievable. It was just so great. You know, it's like it's like that match. Like it was several minutes before its conclusion, where it was like, man, it, it, it felt to me like when I watched the Tanahashi Minoru Suzuki match like four right. or five years ago, right? Where it's like it's it's like there's a point in the match where you go, like, okay, this is a classic, and then they went several minutes more. You know, usually <laughs> I get to like. Like like in in the Omega and Naito match, it was like okay, this is a classic. But that was like in the last two minutes. Right. You know I mean, I mean, but but the um, with the Ishii match, it was several minutes before the end, where it was just like, oh my god, this match. I mean, I mean, it was. Um, I was almost there five minutes in. That's how great you know it opened. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Ishii's selling. I just his selling just blows my mind. So good. Yeah, because it's different. That's the key. It looks. It, and it, I mean, the thing with Ishii is that is that you you feel the match being real and. Um, and um, I mean, I kind of felt that way with um, that that Noah versus um, New Japan. Match. Yes, that yes. Was, oh excellent. my God. Yes, I, I mean, and post match. Yes, like, the pull I, apart. I just thought that that's that to me was like an old time. I mean, that pull apart brawl was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very well done. Shifting focus over to TNA this week, Dave, we got the announcement that Billy Corgan will now assume the role of president under Impact Ventures, which is the new name of the parent company, while Dixie Carter is being shifted over as chief strategy officer and will serve as the chairman of the company. From what you gather, what do these roles essentially mean? Billy Corgan, it it seems like, will be in charge of the day-to-day, and it seems like a a step back for Dixie Carter, at least from the operations on the day-to-day front. I think that's accurate. Um, the thing that's weird to me is, is like, it, like Dixie Carter lives in Nashville, and the offices are in Nashville. I mean, I can't imagine Billy Corgan like being in Nashville every day because he's got his other career, and so it's it's like it's it's hard to be like president of the company while you're a touring rock star. Yeah. Um, but his role has has increased. Uh, so, well, is he going to be involved with like creative as well? Like, is he going to be coming up yes. with ideas? Yes, yes. Well, he's been he's been involved with creative since the day he got there. Mm-hmm. You know, he was always like he, he wasn't necessarily the writer, but he was heavily involved in creative. And right. that's, that's a hit or miss. You know, I mean, like, yeah. they're creative. They're creative right now. Um, it, it, I, you know, it's like there's some stuff they do that I like. Yeah, like the like the way they do the Bobby Lashley stuff yep. and, and Drew Galloway and EC3's feud I liked, and and even like Matt and Jeff Hardy. It's it's so different and weird, but it's it's. I don't know. I like it. But then there's other things like the way they do the knockouts and everything like that where it's just like, God, it's old TNA and it's just garbage sometimes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I'm very curious to see how, how things change with him having more control and if he'll put himself on TV like the way that Dixie well, used to. He, he's going to be on TV. Ugh. I mean, that that's, um, that's just how it is. The bigger picture, Dave, is 
what defines success for TNA in 2016? I mean, they could double their their television audience tomorrow, and I don't really know what that means. You're doing two pay-per-views a year, virtually well, no house shows at all at this point. It seems it's just a matter of being able to create revenue streams, much less make them profitable. They don't even exist at this point. Yeah, I know. That's why, like, when people say, well, if they do this and this in creative, and it's like their problem isn't creative. Yeah. No. You know, I mean, their problem was creative. Creative got them to where they are today, which, which isn't a – but right now, like, if they have great creative, it's like – they and, and the brand is so damaged, it's, yep. it's going to be really hard for them to go on the road and draw. You know, they don't have that buzz. I guess you can always – you can always change that. But in, until we see them going on the road and, and making money on the road and being able to do – you know, I don't know what the right number of pay-per-views is a year, but I've got to think – I got to think you really want about six, you know, and, and, and if you can do that and you can get your guys hot enough to do that, but, but I don't see that happening. And plus they've, they've also done this thing where they pretty much told you that everything that counts is on TV. They're doing these, you know, this title unification match with, with Bobby Lashley and, and James Storm for all the three belts. And that's, isn't that like a pay-per-view match, if you, yeah. know, you know what I mean? But they're doing it on free TV, so you're kind of telling people you don't have to pay for the product. And, and that's not um, – I mean, if you're WWE and you're getting, um, you know, whatever it is, $130 million from USA or $140 million from USA, you can do that. But if you're TNA um, and you've got to expand your um, revenue bases, I, I don't know that that's the way to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, quickly, before we uh, wrap things up, Dave, with UFC 202 next Saturday amidst all of the events going down next weekend, uh, it, it's hard to say because, I mean, this is the week where everything will be ramped up. Conor McGregor is doing more media than I expected. He's doing quite a lot going into this. Uh, are you feeling a million buys on this card? Because I, I'm not quite there on a million yeah, for this one. I don't one. know. Um, right now, I guess I'm a little low, but you know, it, it really, you know, it, it really is from Wednesday This week on. is the key, of course. Uh, I think it's going to be tough. Okay, so the, the key thing that usually, like, gets them really going is that, like, that mainstream stuff. And I think with the Olympics... It's going to be tough. I mean, even though Connor's very quotable, so I think that Connor may be able to pull it off. But I do, you know, it's got to it's got to hurt because anything, as far as mainstream, the Olympics are going to take precedent over, and so um, that'll be tough. It doesn't have a great undercard either. You know, even though Rumble and um, Glover to share is a, a good and you know a title eliminator. But when you really look at that card, I mean, it, Connor's cards are usually pretty loaded underneath, and this one isn't. So that's another, you know, thing. Like when you look back at the show in uh, in March. When they did a million six for the same match, I mean, you had you had a really strong marquee undercard. You had the Holly Holm Misha Tate fight that was a real big deal. And, and what if Connor doesn't win this fight either, Dave? Is that is that the the, the end of that rose? It's not the end of the world, but it, it, this if he loses this fight, unless it's like in a, the right way and it's controversial and people get behind him more, like it's a decision that's close and right. they think he's robbed or something. Yeah, it's, it's, if, he, if he loses by decisive means, it's got to hurt him. Dave, I mean, Dave if he loses... Though, like, you know, it's a dumb fight for him to take because he doesn't need to be fighting at 170. He's not that big. Yeah. And we... he's fighting against a guy much physically bigger than him, and, and that's the whole thing. Connor, you know, he's, Nate, Nate Diaz is not a better fighter than Connor, but he's a bigger guy. And, and stylistically, he's a tough fight because they both want to box, and, and, and Nate's got quick hands, and Nate's got a great chin. And Nate's got great stamina, you know, and, and unless Connor's got great stamina, uh, Connor won't beat Nate, you know, or unless Nate comes in really out of shape. But, you know, the, the last fight, Nate was not in his best shape. Connor was in shape. And, you know, at, at, by, by the middle of the second round, Connor was done. Yeah. Well, he could always go to the WWE. We, we <laughs> might, if Connor loses, we might get the most unbearable Raw of all time <laughs> a week from Monday. Uh, uh, Dave, as we uh, wrap this up, what is coming up in the Observer this week? Oh, well, G1 coverage, the TNA story in depth on everything, all the stuff that they're doing, and then uh, kind of whatever happens. I mean, obviously, built all the big shows this coming weekend. We got Ring of Honor, we got SummerSlam, oh, we got crazy. Takeover, we got Super J. So this coming this Saturday, oh, I mean, insane. What, what, I, I thought today was, I mean, um, yesterday was crazy because it was like, you know, I woke up and the first thing I did was watch, you know, three and a half hours of New Japan, and then stayed up all night and watched New Japan again. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, it's just like it's going to never end. Yeah, I mean, it's between gonna be... six hours of UFC and then trying to figure out how to watch Takeover and then the J Cup, you know, all until you know from <laughs> what is it going to be like my time 
4 o'clock until about 2 in the morning and, or 3 and, in the morning. And SummerSlam with this ridiculous, like, five hours they, or I something. I know. They added another hour to SummerSlam. Like, plus, come you know, on. Plus, you know they're going to go over at the end now. Yep, like, absolutely. I mean, the one thing I used to love about the WWE pay-per-view is that, like, okay, I knew that at 8 o'clock it was done. You know, so I had like an hour until this show starts. But it's like they're gonna—I know they're going to eight thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're gonna do those. They're do, but we get, you're gonna get long main events. And and you know what? The SummerSlam card, when you actually look at that card and the um, Takeover card as well. I mean, when you really look at those lineups, they're really good. The Takeover, you know, Takeover, you know, the the tag title match on Takeover is gonna be great. I think Bailey and Osaka will be great. Uh, Joe and Nakamura will probably be great. And then on on the uh, SummerSlam. I mean, Finn Balor. Finn Balor's going to get a good match out of Roman Reigns, and Dean Ambrose and, and Seth Raw and um, um, Ziggler are going to have to have a good match. And Brock and Randy Orton. I think there's more interest in Brock and Randy Orton than any match on that show. And I think they're I think they're going to work together really good because you know the the deal now is is you know Brock's not saving his body for a UFC fight. I think he's going to probably go out there to kill himself again. Well, Dave, we will uh, chat with you next week after 18, 19 hours of <laughs> MMA and An pro entire wrestling. entire day. Uh, but you have a great week, Dave. Okay, have a great, you too. All right. That is Dave Meltzer, everybody, at WrestlingObserver.com to catch the newsletter and all of their great radio shows.